Hi, I'm Sarah from Nook Coming. Such a pleasure to be able to speak to you about your um, first film that you've directed. Um, so maybe you could just kick off with a brief introduction, um, what the film's about, what people can expect, but also what made you decide that this was the story um, that you first wanted to be behind the camera for? I think that kind of like, you know, uh, as a writer, like a story doesn't like fall into your lap as a whole. Like, I, I don't know if it's the same for other writers actually, but uh, it starts with an image like of somebody or something that happens like or a scene or a moment where you like, and it could be something that you actually experience in reality. And you're like, oh my God, if, you, if I use that in a movie, nobody would believe it or something like that, right? And for me, it was the image of like, this guy with this bright red hair that had these tattoos and was kind of vulnerable, but really manly looking. And what if that guy had done something really bad and he lived in a small context though, like a village or a small town and, and he was going away to jail and then he came back and because he's so recognizable, everybody knows he's back. And I'm from a small town myself, so, you know, when you like I have children now and stuff but when I go back you know like it's just like you your parents tell you oh you know who's in town and you know like everybody knows who's blah 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 so I kind of wanted to recreate that kind of feeling and texture a little bit um, a mix of what I know and what I would like to see like what what would happen if mm -hmm. right and, you know, what made you also want to just to, to place it, like you said, you're from a small town, but in this very particular kind of area of America. And it's, you know, it is a scene of deprivation, everyone struggling to make ends meet, um, but you recreate it, you know, wonderfully. So what was it also about the locations and the setting of the story that was important to you? Well, I live, um, I live in Los Angeles for, I mean, I, almost 20 years now. So it is my home, but it isn't, right? Um, and the funny thing is like, as a European, and I'm sure you've done that before. I mean, everyone knows this from traveling, really. You know, when you're not where you were born or grew up, they're still like on a human level or on a small level, you know, like there's so many details and things that are actually exactly the same, but people mm -hmm. speak maybe a different language or this and that. And so I just kind of try to focus on the humanity between people, between moms and sons and, and people's angers and small communities and people going to church and, and neighbors and stuff like that. And, uh, and when, when I focused on those things in, in my storytelling, I think it, at least to me and other people too, like it didn't really matter that you know, I wasn't from an American small town or that this was an, you know, I could have told that story totally in Germany as well. No problem. You know, you exchange a couple of things and have everyone speak German. It's quite universal actually, but I live here and um, this world is actually about 45, 50 minutes away from Los Angeles. You know, like it's on the periphery of this big city. You have these, you know, strip mall driven, you know, weird towns where there's so many churches, but nobody has work kind of a thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, it, especially like uh, in the contrast with like the golden California sunlight, um, I like this, like, Calif I would call it like uh, California Tristesse. It's kind of crazy, you know? Like it's, you have this beautiful golden light as you see it also in the film and then you have like this roughness and this anger and this really darkness also and of course things like that coexist in the world in movies right and so I wanted to capture that a little bit too and in the same way it's kind of there but it is also the backdrop because what you focus in on is you know the characters so although kind of life at the margins is definitely there as our setting, it's not the, the, the root of the story. Actually, the root of the story is how this one particular figure has to go back and, and face his past. And what I think is also interesting is that a lot of it remains kind of obscure to the viewer. So I also wondered, um, you know, what you thought the effect of that was, you know, never fully understanding what it was that he'd done and why really, or, or what he'd experienced the time he's been away in jail? Um, I think I, I feel like 
well, sometimes if I see movies where someone has done something terrible and um, people talk about it a lot, um, I feel two things. I feel like I'm invited to judge, you know, like, oh, if he has done that, hmm, do I really want to watch him do this now? And it kind of really occupies my mind. And it, um, and what happens then is, is that I, I really can't keep a clear view on my very own experience with the characters. And I think also sometimes in movies or books, there's so many assumptions made why someone did something. And, and it kind of is so overemphasized when you see people and characters talk about it in a movie where I'm like, really, how do you know? Like, is it so straightforward? You know, this guy did something. All we need, really need to know from Marvin's perspective is I did, I killed an old woman in my, you know, community. I don't really know why. It's hinted in throughout the story, his brother killed himself. There's no dad, there's bottled up anger. He's definitely not educated. He has no ability to kind of analyze what's going on in his life. You know, so one thing leads to another and it's awful and he can't even understand it. But then if you're Marvin, you're like, okay, I went to jail for 20 years. I did my penance. So now I'm good, right? Okay, cool. So I'm going to go back home and pick it up, you know, and he tries and he realizes that that's not how it works <laughs> for the people who are still living there, who are family of the woman that he killed. And I think that's really interesting thing that I wanted to explore is the mechanism of forgiveness. You know, you can kind of have this invisible agreement, agreement, well, if you do something, you do penance, then you're good, we're good. Or you can say, well, sure, but you know, everyone has their own timing. You know, everybody needs different things to understand, comprehend, forgive. The mom needs to see her son uh, beaten up to pieces in order to soften and let him in, you know, like, so everyone's different. Sorry, that was a super long answer to your question. <laughs> I kind of veered off, sorry. No, I think that's really interesting. And, and, you know, and this idea of when people serve time that although in the justice system, that should be the end of it. Of course, yeah, real life doesn't play out that way. And the things like just small things, like he doesn't understand how to use a smartphone. He's asking about, you know, stick on the CD that we used to listen to. Actually, the whole world has changed and yeah. he has remained in some ways a teenager in a child, a child. So oh, yeah. him having to re-enter the world is just, you know, such an uphill struggle for him. Totally. Yeah. I mean, and it's a nice, fun game that we played a lot on set, you know, like when we t thought about the scenes where he just doesn't even know how to... <laughs> How to, where the button is on the iPhone, you know, like all the things that you would miss. And that's how we're like, oh my God, he doesn't know what The Bachelor is, Game of Thrones, all these like la things that happened in the last, you know, 15, 20 years that people kind of talk about that are part of pop culture, you know, or, or just culture, I guess, right? Um, that was fun, yeah. And it's an also interesting look kind of at different types of masculinity, because I guess, you said we've got this incredibly striking appearance which maybe looks like you know could potentially be aggressive yet he's very restrained and often has a sort of yeah. you know youthful tenderness um about him and of course there are scenes where we see him be incredibly vulnerable and you know he even when he's faced with aggression he doesn't seem to rise to it so do you think that was yeah. something also interesting for you to explore kind of that idea of masculinity yeah, for sure. I mean, it's one of the pillars of the story, especially, you know, like with all the stereotypes and expectations that come in that world where he's from. And it's interesting because you see in the very beginning of the film when Marvin comes home and he sees the black nurse played by Ralph Howery tending to his mom and he under misunderstands and he attacks him. It's a very explosive short moment where you see the full range of his physical abilities like he could no problem like you know shut someone down and you know Jake McLaughlin who's our Marvin he was a soldier you know he's incredibly strong and fast and at the same time you see him later like proving that like doing push-ups I think he did like 3,000 push-ups on the day um, but 
I think it was interesting for me to, like you said, to have someone almost in a wondrous way experience himself with restraint and then having access to a tenderness that felt good to him without really being able to fully comprehend what's going on with him, you know? And then because of that, in that moment, he's able to meet Delta on a completely different level because he's so willing to not, you know, play the big guy and, and fulfill that expectation of, you know, male stereotype that often exists in these, you know, socioeconomic contexts. That sounded really big, sorry about that. <laughs> but you know what I mean, yeah. you know, and I think that's why they are even able to connect actually, because he allows it. And maybe we can talk a little bit about your cast because Jake just seems perfect for the role in the way yeah. that we said, you know, his physicality, um, but also there's just so much that he's able to convey with actually yeah. very limited dialogue. And then of course, you know, absolute screen veteran in, in, in Kathy Bates and, and Ashling, who seems to be very much, you know, a star on the rise. So how did you know these were the right people for your kind of central characters? I think you just kind of have to follow your intuition a little bit. With Jake, we looked so much. And then I saw a picture of him and I was like, who's that? And then I read that he, you know, he was a, has a whole other history. He was a soldier in Iraq. He grew up kind of actually where Marvin grew up. So there were so, so many background similarities. And when I met him, we never, you know, I had this idea of being a director. I was like, well, I think we have to talk about the script now. <laughs> uh, but he, no, he didn't want to, or he didn't, it's not what he needed. So we talked about Game of Thrones a lot and this and that. And, you know, he talked to me a little bit about his past and it turned out that was much more, you know, beneficial and better for all of us, you know? Mm. And he was just so, open and fearless honestly like he I just tried to always kind of protect him so that he had a space Kathy Bates loved him of course you know she knows she can see like this guy's giving so much you know you just plug into that and he would literally in every rehearsal like oh, I blow people away where you were like hey it's just a rehearsal just you know save it for later but he was just 200 percent all the time it was crazy I was, I feel really lucky, like, you know, and I can't imagine, you know, now I can't even imagine anybody else to have and taken that seat, you know? Mm. And obviously you've had such an incredible career already as an actress, you know, going right back to Run, Load, Run and, you know, the Bourne uh, films. And so what do you, how do you look back on kind of that part of your career? And, you know, was it always a dream of yours to make it into directing? And do you think this would be where you'll, you'll head next? I would love to stay in directing. It's a whole different timing, pace type situation. Unfortunately, it took me four years to, you know, from beginning writing to end um, with my film, which is, pretty good timeline actually that sounds like a lot of time but it isn't you know and it takes forever to like get movies off the ground I'm working on it I've written scripts and stuff so that is the goal in the meantime I'll act I love acting I love you know I love set life and I've done it for so many years I think it's definitely intertwined it's it makes sense you know I think at some point I was just I wasn't like oh I hate acting now I think I just felt that you know, the space it's given to me as an actor is a lot smaller, you know, mm -hmm. than the decision making when you write and direct. And I felt maybe, uh, yeah, I'm very cocky, but I felt like I, I have stuff to say to, about the other stuff too. You know, I, I want a little bit more responsibility. I want to create and shape a little bit more. And I love the experience. So I'm really hoping, let's see how the world shapes up to be, you know. Um, I would really love to do that again soon. And what do you ultimately hope that people will take away from watching this film? Um, I, I think the, the bottom line is that you, as you know, probably every director, we always hopes that people are moved, you know, that there's something in the movie that 
kind of stays with them a little bit, you know? I know those movies myself, you know? My husband and I watch them and then kind of come back to them like a few days later. You're like, you know what's interesting? So that if, I, if, if Home to Some People was that kind of movie, I'd be good. That would right. be good. I think I'm out of time, but it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much. And I really enjoyed the film and best of luck with your future ventures after this as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Love to speak to you. Thank you.